Welcome to another episode of Emerald Echo, a Green Lantern podcast and vidcast. As always, I'm your host, Adam, and with me is my co-host, the Emerald enthusiast himself, Donnie. Donnie, how's it going? Hey, what's up, Lantern fans? It's the man whose ring runs on Fanboy Energy, the podcasting machine, the big nerd in green. It's the Emerald enthusiast back to talk to you about Green Lantern number eight and number nine. Yeah, double Emmy. Um, it's been a while uh, since we've, 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 we've done a, a Green Lantern podcast. Uh, and we're back! We, we are indeed. Um, the books continue um, to be uh, uh, entertaining, enjoyable reads. And, uh, and so... Because we were a little behind, we thought it was high time that we um, brought you our thoughts on the latest issues. So that's what we're going to do today. There's no real, there's no real, real Green Lantern news per se, other than a recent revelation that Jessica Cruz will be in the Super Pets movie, which means. Donnie, who was not originally going to probably see the Super Pets movie, is now going to have to see the Super, <laughs> exactly. uh, the Super Pets movie, I should say. And uh, yeah, that's when I thought I was out. They reel me back no, in. <laughs> no, 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 Donnie. If it had, if the movie had featured Nort, would you have gone to see it? Uh, I probably would have done some yoga. Mm-hmm. And breathe deeply, and put put it on sometime by myself, and tried to find anything positive I could say about <laughs> Nort. Um, and you know why I do that? That's payback for all the times that you like to do that. We are the Flash BS. So <laughs> mentioning Nort is my payback. So there it is. That's uh, yeah, that's right. So what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Andy. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, I am excited. Even if Jessica just makes a couple small cameos, I'm excited to see. Anytime you get one of the titular lanterns, I'm always excited for that. So Indeed, yeah. Yeah. And it does have the rock as crypto, so even though I'm not a crypto fan, it should be interesting to hear the rock again. So I think, uh, in, look, anything the rock is in, I give a chance. Um I, I think, look, am I going to run out to the theater and go watch the League of Super Pets or whatever the heck it's, its full title is? No. But to be fair, I'm not running to the theater to watch anything. And that includes Spider-Man No Way Home. That, that's that a in, hard pill to swallow. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That includes Ghostbusters Afterlife. Another hard pill to swallow. And the way the case counts are going... That may include the Batman, as 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 angry as I'm already getting at getting at that prospect, because folks, in my how old am I? Uh, almost 38 years of existence, I have never missed a live action Batman film in my lifetime, in theaters, and we're facing a prospect that that may be a reality. Um, so, it's nothing against. The Super Pets movie, per se, is just this pandemic has taught me that <laughs> no movie is that prescient to me that I'm going to, you know, rush out and, and see it, you know. Yeah. Well, likewise, you know, I don't, there's no no scenario where I want to sit around a group of people right now. So. If I have to wait 45 days to watch, certainly the League of Super Pets, but the Batman or the Flash or Black Adam, since we're talking about The Rock, whatever the movie is, as long as this craziness in this world pursues the way it's going or continues the way it's going, then it's streaming for me. Right. Likewise. I lucked out with Venom Let There Be Carnage at the drive-in movie, but obviously that's closed for the winter, so it's all about streaming right now. Yeah. Or Blu-ray release, so. Indeed, yeah, whichever comes first. 
Yeah. But, but I think that's all the news that we have that's Green Lantern related. Yeah. Well. So let's go on to Green Lantern number eight and nine, the 2021 versions, that is. Yeah, of course. Well, right. So important to point out. Important to point out. Just in case this is your first time. So welcome to the show. Yeah, this yeah. opens up welcome. with if this is your yeah. first episode. Exactly. Go back and listen to all the other podcasts because they are wonderful and we are happy to have you here yeah. on Multiverse Musings. Anytime and, we get new listeners, we're, we're pleased. Exactly. And look us up on social media. We'd love to hear from you. Indeed. So this starts with a flashback to the birth of the Omniverse. And we see John heading to planet Anacidus in the dark sector Dark Sector number one. Mm -hmm. Remember, we're opening with John. The revelation is that he has joined the Ascended. And we're learning about the Ascended, what that means. And so we see Salak and Hanu and Kilowog are all in battle. And they are being overwhelmed by the brainwashed, turned forces of the Lightbringer. Now, John's powers are manifesting and he comes to the aid of of the depowered Green Lanterns with Kens and Lonar in tow. I love the outfit of John here, by the way. Mm. I don't know whether that was, whether Jeff Thorne had a hand in that design, but I I really like um, how John is being drawn here. I love the coloring, the way the energy is coming out. And uh, it's just great to see like a Green Lantern uniform again, um, I mean, obviously we're seeing Joe's, but in this story, yeah, more proper one. Where, where's, yeah, like even in the earlier issues of this, the flashbacks of John, mm -hmm. or not the flashbacks, sorry, the, the the John portion of the story. Yeah, the costume kind of looked like it didn't fit him, and and <laughs> you know what I mean? It, yeah, it looked, I mean it didn't look bad. It just looked a little off. Something about it was off. Mm -hmm. But what we're getting here looks fantastic. Well, I, I like the dress costume, too, that we saw in the early issues. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was yeah. great, yeah. So I, I want a figure of that, and I want a figure of this costume, too. So get on it, McFarlane. Anyway, so. <laughs> you know what you got to do, Don? You get a hashtag McFarlane. Right. And his, like, <laughs> exactly. Even when he's talking about his Christmas tree, like, hashtag about the Green Lantern figures you want. Yeah. And eventually, if you do that long enough for, like, a year and a half, two years, three years, You'll do two things. You'll finally get them to capitulate because they don't want to hear you anymore. Mm -hmm. And then you can claim it's a global phenomenon. You're tweeting. <laughs> because the social media imprint will be you know, so so high because you've been tweeting collectively for, for a year to three years. And, mm -hmm. and that's the way things are measured. Right. Think, so. Or or McFarlane would get a restraining order against me. Maybe that's well, it. That too, <laughs> which is the more likely scenario. I digress. So the the narrative continues here. We see that Lonar is trying to push John to a per particular thing that he wants him to do. There's this overarching story that Lonar is saying there's something bigger here than just you know the troubles of of this planet and your former Green Lanterns. And he's like, "You're thinking too small, John. You're thinking like a Green Lantern." And I really like the emotion that came out here. This is what Jeff Thorne really gets John Stewart. I know not everybody likes this title, but I do because I feel like he nailed John's personality. And John's like, I am a Green Lantern. We save everyone we can. That's who we are. And that's what we do, even without the rings. Yeah. No, and, uh, yeah. You, you, you can't argue that Jeff Thorne doesn't understand John Stewart. Right. You always hear about writers trying to get the right voice. This is John Stewart's voice right here. Well, all, all I want, like from my when I when I see a, a, a writer or an artist or whatever, you know, both board a group or or a character that I enjoy that was one of my favorites, or a franchise, an IP that's one of my favorites. My all, all I'd like to know is that on some level, 
the people making the thing mm -hmm. on some level enjoy the character at the very least. And if they have a passion and understanding for that character, all the better. Yeah. And you could tell that Jeffrey Thorne has a passion and understanding of John Stewart. Yes, I would agree. And uh, we should also point, it was actually Chris Cross that joined for this um, issue. Right. Yeah. And again, loving the art and the, the art is not to be confused by the band because there was a band. <laughs> right, right. In the nineties. So speaking of art, speaking of visuals, John begins to build a ship, and I, I'm always overly excited when I see John start to build complex things because you know his constructs are going to be. Well, big. he's a master builder. Right? <laughs> exactly. And he used to work as an architect. Hmm. So. I love it. I, whenever I see that. Hashtag I, John Stewart worked with blueprints. And, you know, because there, there's a hashtag that says hashtag so-and-so is the blueprint. And, you know, right. mine is hashtag <laughs> John Stewart worked with blueprints. Work, work, works with blueprints. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we see the, the angels of the light bringer arrive and they attack John. And again, uh, talked about this overarching thing that Lonar is, is wanting John to do. Lonar says, the source has set you on a different road. And John gets really annoyed with Lonar here. And I like that dynamic that Lonar's trying to help him along on this journey. Again, he's the god of journeys. And John's like, there are things that I can't let go of here. I can't just drop everything, drop being a hero just to go do what you want me to do. Yeah. And John's like, you know, what are you trying to tell me? Why are you being so cryptic? And I really like the line. Lonar says, I'm not the guy. I'm the God of journeys, not the God of telling you everything you need to know. <laughs> I was like, he's a little bit of a smart aleck too, isn't he? <laughs> it seems to be. Yeah. And God of journeys. So does that mean he's like humming? Don't stop believing. Someday <laughs> love will find you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew where you were going, man. <laughs> the one music reference that Donnie understood. Hey, exactly. I, I I should get a muffin for that. I need a muffin and some coffee for that. Well, you'll have to contact Steven about that. Uh, that's right. Okay. I'm not the muffin man. <laughs> so John goes through this portal after the light bringer, and I like that Lonar says end prologue. So Things are definitely ready to pick up. Business is ready to pick up, as JR would say. All right, JR. <laughs> <laughs> and we get a repeating of what Ganthet said in issue one. You are the bridge. Remember that line? You are the bridge. Yes. And John arrives to see this titanic being of light made, being made, and... There are more of these angels there, as well as the guy in the chair. And in the next issue, we get to see who the guy in the chair is. Indeed we do. You know what's interesting about the Lightbringer? Hmm? Does that feel like a cult leader to you? Because it does to me. Like... In fact, I actually said something like that in, in one of my notes here. So that was okay. one of the themes. It was... It was, you know, free will and free thinking versus, you know, the cult, the hive mind type of thing. Yeah, I know. It's very, just like that name and then his look, it's very cult-like, right? It's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's something that came to mind to me. So the scene switches to Joe Mullane and Pea Fell back on Oa. Again, we're getting this part of the story that's drawn by Marco Santucci. Right. And they're watching a replay of the young and the guardians gathering. And Koyos and Nemosini, we see that those two, again, this is a replay, they disagree with the, what the guardians are about to do. We also learned that they think that Kelly's power, the gauntlet, draws power from the bleed, mm. which makes its power level just amazing. Inside, yeah. Exactly. 
Insane. Yeah. The other revelation, and we're starting to get big answers here. Koyos has been making these clandestine journeys to Xerox, which is the home planet of the Bright Circle. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Nemesini has been making her own secret journeys to Earth. A lot of secrets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Joe has to quell a simmering fight after she and, and Payafel watch this replay. She has to quell a simmering fight between the depowered lanterns and the United Planet security. Mm -hmm. And I really like the interaction here, the, the dialogue between Iolande questions Joe, and she was like, I don't know who you are. Who who are you to be giving other lanterns orders? Who in the blue hell are you? <laughs> right. And that's when Joe holds up the belt and she's like, I'm the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever was. No, 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 that's something different. Anyway, actually, she's like, <laughs> actually, she's like, there's your Canada reference for this episode. There it is. Yeah. Actually, is. she's like, who I am is the last one standing. She's like, you know, I, I'm the one who has the ring. She's not wrong, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that's why I think part of the reason I like Joe so much is that in some ways her journey, and I may have said this before, that it echoes what Kyle had to do when he was the torchbearer, when he was the only one. Now, granted, this is partially John's story, but she's in a situation to where it's just her and support from, again, Kelly, who's not really a Green Lantern, and Simon, who's injured and depowered. Yeah, I mean, and also Simon is so worried about Kelly. Exactly. How much use can he be? Mm -hmm. But I like how, you know, she's trying to be a diplomat. She's trying to figure out all of this stuff. And you can tell she's really annoyed by all the problems that are not central to her figuring out what's going on here. Right. But also it's important that that Joe is the one, you know, quelling these disputes. She's the one most uniquely qualified for it because of her, of her past, you know, from all the stuff that we saw in Far Sector, it really makes her the ideal person to kind of have this responsibility. And I like that, you know, she tells the United Planets Brigade that she's invoking the council privilege. And she's like, these ex ex lanterns they're now citizens of Oa. They can go anywhere except for Guardian Tower and the science cells. Yep. And she's like, all of you get your stuff together because I've got bigger problems. Yeah. So yeah, like I said, I like how you know Jeff Thorne has continued her on from Far Sector, and he seems to have gotten her voice too. Yeah, she just continually um, grows. And develops as a character. That that's the beauty of of sort of watching, you know, a, a relatively new character continue to grow as the issues go on, and 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 the story develops, and you have different writers and you tackle them. It adds layers onto the character, and you really see them grow and and, mm -hmm. and mature. And, and we're definitely seeing that here. Right. Speaking of character development, at the very end of this issue, we see Payafel come to the realization that this is not a lab. The lab she was in, Nemesini's lab, she's like, this is a forge. And just as she comes to this, we get the big heel turn. Here comes Nemesini in the back, wham. Payafel is knocked out. By the way, I really like how Marco Santucci draws Payafel's face when she's knocked out unconscious and you get kind of the close-up. Her face as well as Nemesini. He does really well drawing those faces. Yeah. But you can almost hear JR going, what, what is the meaning of this king? The third man. <laughs> what is Nemesini doing? <laughs> yeah. No, actually, he, he's not the third man. The person in issue number nine is the third man. There you go. So we're going to rate the... What, what would you rate issue number eight? Um, hmm. Story, I'm going to give a 4.5. Hmm? 
and aren't I going to give a perfect five? I'm going to I'm going to echo your sentiments exactly. So, yep, this is it's coming along nicely, and like I said, I think that. Um, and you know, even though Chris Cross was a part of this, it wasn't such a, it wasn't, it wasn't jarring. It wasn't. Yeah, no, no, it it didn't feel out of place at all. He fit right in. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, he still put his unique stamp on, on, you know. I, I, like I said, I really like that outfit. I I want that in figure form so bad. So. Just pining for figures. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. The next issue, and I mean that's nothing new. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's how we met. I mean, like the- okay, folks, uh, Warner Brothers in DC. Can't you see his room is in dire need of another couple of figures? Exactly. I'm I'm in dire need. I'm desperate. I mean, need. <laughs> even his wife wrote a letter to Santa Claus asking for more figures. <laughs> you know, come on, help bro, help the guy out. <laughs> So issue number nine, we get the big revelation that the guy in the chair is Isak, who was a New Gods character that it's been quite a while since we've seen this character. I believe it was the mid 80s. And well, he did, he, I didn't remember who that was. OK, he was a he was a deformed scientist that was born on New Genesis. But because of his uh, deformity, he eventually ends up on Apocalypse. This is what again. I'm just pulling this from memory here. So yeah, no, that's it. I'm glad you said that because I had no idea. It's been a long time. Again, Jeff Thorne is obviously leaning very deeply into the new gods and Jack Kirby's work. You know, yeah, he seems very well versed in that mythology. Yeah, which is why, and I'll say this too: in many ways, he's subverted my expectations. I haven't had all the answers, and I don't mind that. I like to be surprised after 40 plus years of reading comics. I like to somehow say, Oh, wow. That's something I didn't expect. That's fun. I, 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 I as a, as a fan, I want to be surprised as well. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to be, see, there's that fine line of being utterly confused. You know, by what's going on, because you have no clue of what's going on. <laughs> and and the, then there's the opposite where you're entertained um, and confused because and surprised because you didn't expect something to go in that direction. And, you know, that's the kind of surprise and confused I like. Whereas, you know, there there are books and, and creators who, you know, I'm confused and surprised just because I don't understand what the heck is going on. Whereas I'm understanding what's going on, but I don't have a preconceived notion of where we're going to end up. Well, you talked earlier about the kind of cultic aura around the Lightbringer. Yeah. John is furious at what Isak is doing. And, and by that, I mean, you know, turning these sentient creatures to the will of the Lightbringer and making right. them these brainwashed soldiers. And it kind of reminded me of the um, the, the, the narrative and, and, and the conflict in the first Avengers film, what Loki said, you know, I'm here to free you from, from freedom, from free will, from individuality. Right. You know, that's what the Lightbringer thinks is... Or that's what Isak thinks that is the right thing to do. And John, you know, obviously he he digs his heels in. And he's like, you're taking these people's ability to resist away. You know, yeah. I mean, and I, I love that when John stands up to him in that way, it really is that aspect of no fear from John. John's perspective. He's not... He's not concerned or, or or intimidated by the power set mm-hmm. or or, or how the or, much he may be. Yeah, or the numbers. He he's just yeah. angry, you know. Yeah. So yes. during this fight, John is seemingly knocked unconscious, and he has 
the same recurring dream we saw in the earlier issues about high school. Only in this one, at the end, everyone morphs into the Guardians, including Ganthet. Mm. And John wakes and he tells Lonar, he's like, I feel like Superman. And Lonar makes a point here. He was like, Kryptonians can only draw from solar radiation as part of the Ascended. You can draw from any cosmic force. Hmm. So I guess we are to assume at this point, John is more powerful than Superman. Hmm. Yeah, Uh, it it would seem that way based on the dialogue. Hmm. Um, It'd be fun to get a throwdown between John and and so I, I, I'm always down for that. I love the, the the scene in Rebirth where you know John was temporarily taken over by Parallax, and he's you know he tells Superman he's like even the strongest structures have their weak yeah. points, and he used his used his ring to hit Superman in the eyes. The yeah. only thing we'd have to ascertain uh, because if John is that much more powerful than Superman, and they're gonna fight, we need a sort of throwing the white flag or or a neutralizing uh, effect so that let's say John doesn't beat the living crap out of Superman or hypothetically vice versa if if Superman could get the other upper hand. And basically what I want to know from you is is John Stewart's mother's name Martha? (laughs) No, I was just thinking, I was like, you know, if Superman has, you know, Somebody, uh, somebody in his family who has a matching name to somebody in, you know, the the core or John's, uh, you know, his past love life, like Marin or somebody yeah. like that, or uh, excuse me, Moraine. Uh, yeah, <laughs> why'd you say that name, Superman? Yeah, uh, <laughs> let's not go there. We already did that this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I want my Martha World Order shirt though. So yeah, yeah, we're gonna we should put those into production. <laughs> So one of the things that we learn here, again, well, we learned a part, is that John's abilities, we learned from Lonar that the Guardians misinterpreted John's abilities from the start. They thought it was part of the emotional spectrum, but it seems that Jeffrey Thorne is suggesting that they aren't. That, again, John's special and some kind of, in some way outside of using just the will energy. Oh, absolutely. I think uh, there's definitely more at play than than the energy of will here, for sure. Um, And uh, it's just nice to see John be kind of imbued and with his power and seemingly, in effect, making him the most powerful Green Lantern. Yeah, I mean, this seems to be a power level that, other other than Ion, I mean, we, we've never seen yeah. a Green Lantern possess this kind of power before. So it will be interesting to see so, how... So could it potentially be if Kyle is Ion and John with his power... In those states, they're they. You could assume that they're the most powerful Green Lanterns. Oh, when Kyle was Ion, remember he he had the power to basically shape reality. He could be in yeah. multiple places at once and doing anything. So, so if John, if John, if uh, his power level is similar, then yes, you would think yeah, that so eventually they, he'd have those those powers. So if John and Kyle are are, are at any given time you know, the most powerful Green Lanterns there are, that's going to, that's going to infuriate the, 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 the right people. Uh, <laughs> and I like, I like when, when moronic members of fandom get, get, get infuriated. I will uh, say this though. It looks like how Jordan is in issue number 11. I think there's a solicitation that shows him on the cover. So, okay. So could just be a variant, but it looks like he, hypothetically, some yeah. people be, I mean, we we have seen, you know, yeah, we saw it in the Green Lantern annual that he was on his way to Oa. I guess he finally makes his way there. So, yeah. Now, we see that. the third man. uh, (laughs) I mean, he's kind of already turned. He's already done his NWO turn, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, and he he did a a turn like that in DC versus Vampires too. Yeah. Yep. Which, by the way, I have right here. I got to show you the variant cover. This is the foil cover with the Hal Jordan. Yeah. That's nice. That is yeah. Nice. 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 All right. So back to the issue at hand here. John attacks the forming body of the Lightbringer. And we're told that he causes a god storm. Now, I looked that up, and I don't remember any DC reference to a god storm. There is a reference from Marvel Comics having to do with Thor, but not DC. So I don't exactly know what that means. I'm interested to find out with issue number 10. So we'll have to wait and see what, what Jeff, Stor- Jeff Thorne has in store for us in that wait with respect to that. And no, that doesn't mean to go ask him, Donnie. Let the man to, tell a story. I have to fight the urge so much. One of the variant covers actually here, one of the variant covers, and it's hard to see, Arculo is actually in the background. And it made me want to go ask Jeff. I was like, now, is this just artistic license, which I think it is? Or are you going to do something with Arculo where he joins the core? But I was like, I shouldn't bother the man. I want to, but <laughs> yes. When in doubt, when in doubt, make that your default setting. Do not bother the man. <laughs> exactly. I have to tell myself that all the time. Anyway, so now we on to the Joe portion of this issue. We see her go to the science cells to interrogate Uridian of the Bright Circle, and the funniest line in this. I love this line. She he tells Uridian, "I have questions." You have answers. We talk. When I'm happy, I go back to my job, and you can get back to mumbling crazy. (laughs) Oh, you have no idea how I want to use that line on certain Twitter people. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But that, uh, yeah, Jeff Thorne knows how to write some dialogue. That was funny. So Now, Even inside the cell, magic is afoot, and Joe is suddenly outdoors and not via teleport because she asks her ring, have I been teleported? And the ring says no. Joe realizes, you know, she's outdoors, she's vulnerable, and she makes armor that actually kind of makes her look like Shredder. Uh, Yeah, good point. Yeah, good Uh, point. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. So now she's attacked by fairies, which you wouldn't think would hurt, but obviously these are some very aggressive fairies and there's a lot of them really beautiful coloring in this scene by the way oh i thought it's that was awesome you, that you mentioned that because i thought i thought you know first of all i've said it before i said i'll say it again marco santucci could draw anything and, yeah and it would look amazing yeah um and, and that's true of this issue um but the coloring uh here was phenomenal um and furthering that you know the outside landscape that that joel is eventually transported to that looks so vibrant and and colorful and lush and it was just beautiful but it reminded me of you know one of those off worlds that they'd visit in in the in the classic star trek Mm -hmm. right yeah and knowing uh, Jeffrey Thorne's Star Trek, his love for Star Trek, uh, at least I think it was Jeffrey Thorne I, I saw posting about Star Trek. Uh, not to Oh, yeah, he likes Star Trek, yeah. Uh, so I wonder if that has an influence. I mean, I know Marco is drawing it, but I wonder if there's some uh, notes or dialogue being passed around between the two where... Star Trek is referenced at all. It, it could be. They they are obviously both well-versed on many different media shows, you know, uh, sci-fi and fantasy. So I'm not surprised that we got something that looked that good. Yeah. But at this point, Uridian tells Joe that Koyos came to the Bright Circle to erase the mistake of the Guardians. And that the arrow we saw seemingly kill Koyos actually didn't kill him. It just changed him. Okay. And that's what happened to the battery. When his body was put in the battery, there was a detonation. Mm. And that's what happened. 
That's not anything. I, 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 I'm going to admit this to you. I didn't even think in that direction. I'm going to be honest. I knew that there was some connection to Oa. I didn't think that it was a straight invasion by the Bright Circle or the right. Magic Wielders. That's what I was calling them at the time. But I knew there had to be some kind of connection. Somebody on Oa had something to do with it. But I'm going to be honest. I thought it was Amara Collin, the Thanagarian. Yeah. I thought she was the most likely suspect. I never thought that Koyos would be still alive in some manner. So, Good point. Yeah, right. I, I didn't see this coming either, for sure. So back in the cell, I like how Joe fights back with the spider constructs. Those were really cool. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I was singing Spider Joe, Spider Joe, but anyway. They look really good. They look really, really good. Yeah. And again, that's something that always attracts me to Green Lantern is the different ways that the lanterns use use their rings, the way that they fight back, the creativity from their minds. So Uridian refers to herself as the master opener. And she says, no door I open can ever be denied to me again. And so she was previously in the Shadow Vault, and that means that they're in the Shadow Vault now, she and Joe. Interesting. And originally I was thinking like the Chamber of Shadows, like where, you know, the Guardians initially had Volthoom, but I don't mm -hmm. think that's what they're talking about here. <coughs> no, and that also sounds like a Harry Potter uh, movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just... So the big revelation at the end is that Koyos comes back and he is now the anti-guardian. And so we have another heel turn. We kind of saw this one coming, though. So it's like, you know, the partner turn. Uh, you so. know, it's funny because the way some of the, the uh, guardians have been behaving you know, in recent memory. Right. That's kind of anti Guardian anyway. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. But this seems to be, this is something that, uh, I, I don't remember this type of storyline from any of the Guardians. I mean, there's Scar, of course. You know, we remember that from Blackest Night. But this is something altogether different. And I like this idea Agreed. that now you have a couple of rogue Guardians and there aren't any Guardians to help out the Green Lanterns and you only have Joe at this point on Oa to defend against this. So the odds are stacked against them going forward. Oh, most definitely. Yeah. And again, I want to say that I like the themes that are running through here of, again, you know, self-reliance and free thinking against cultic thinking. Um, you know, I like you know, the, the way that the Lanterns are trying to adapt. And of course, magic versus will, the super science of the Green Lanterns. You're getting all this kind of fused together in a really nice story. Yeah, no, it's... it's what I love about the story is it's taking big swings. It's, it's, um, it's not afraid to shake the mythology. Um, and... It really, it pulls off a grand scale complex storyline mm -hmm. without being outright confusing and <coughs> unreadable. You know what I mean? Yes, exactly. So, yeah, I, I really loved it. I thought the art in both segments was great. Um, I thought... I, I, it just amazes me how how layered and complete each story feels. Like each portion of the story, the John Stewart portion, yeah, and the um, the John Bolan story, yeah, you really are getting. You're getting fleshed out storylines from both. Mm -hmm. And what I think that provides you, at least from my perspective, is 
it's like you're getting two stories in one book. Yes. So when you get that four ninety nine cover price, it's like, yeah, I'm getting my money's worth. Yeah, I would totally agree. Like, By the it, way, I should mention too, Joe at the end of this book is seemingly depowered. Yeah, she comes, I mean, she she comes out looking. I mean, she's got a cool hairstyle. Yeah, yeah, she she looks very different. Yeah. And she, but she doesn't have her uniform on. It's just a shirt and some shorts. And her ring seems to be sputtering. So I don't know if that's a temporary thing or. Yeah, I, I, now that you mentioned that the ring is kind of, yeah. Yeah. I wonder what's going on there. Yeah, I, I Again, I can't wait to see that. You know, I try to avoid solicits when it comes to Green Lantern, especially when it's this type of like mystery story, but it's hard not to peek ahead a little bit. So the, the only time I, it's funny because like. DC I, Comics. I try to avoid reading them, but I'm like, when I, yeah, uh, both covers, yeah. yeah. But when I, uh, Number eight. when I have to send in my pull list to my comic store, mm -hmm. it's like I kind of have to look for Green yeah. Lantern to make sure <laughs> to make sure it's scheduled for that month, right? Because you never know. She number nine. I really like the variant cover. I like them oh, both. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Um, both covers are good, but, but yep. yeah. DC Comics. Support the comic book industry. Indeed, definitely. Um, if you have a comic shop near you and you have the room for physical comics, do that. And if you don't, do Comicsology. Or DC exactly. Infinite if you have it in the States. Yeah, like I do. Here in Canada, it's not available, so got to wait. Um, but yeah, I guess we should rate this issue. I'm going to give this issue a five on both counts. I love oh, yeah. the art, especially like we were talking about, you know, the what happened once Joe went into the cell. And again, the writing here, the the fact that Jeff was able to completely surprise me and be like, oh, OK, I didn't see that happening at all. Again, I like that. So, yeah, because. Too often. You know, I've read some comics that are so predictable that you know what's going to happen, or the solicits kind of, if you read them, say too much. I, I think it's like been, the annual this year. <laughs> yeah, but with the exception of that, the Green Lantern solicits have been pretty good. Yeah. And you're kind of withholding details. So, yeah, there was that snafu, but overall, it's pretty it's been pretty solid so but yeah i i just love that by the way can you stand up and show everybody your shirt before the ish uh the episode ends because that shirt is awesome looking sure i can uh no it's not green lantern related but no but it's my favorite marvel character yay it's venom so here we yeah. go yeah yeah look at that oh man it's, i love it love there it go. that's my my venom shirt um but uh, i need a green lantern shirt and unfortunately the ones that were available at fandom only shipped in the states so that doesn't really help me uh dc um so you know help a fan out make some shirts send them to canada i'll buy them because <laughs> i certainly need one but you yeah, know i i just love like the fact that I'm constantly surprised by the direction this series is going, mm -hmm. and also the fact that it is really kicking up the sci-fi aspect. Like, aspect, I, yeah. Well, again, I get, I get, I get so much nods to Star Trek here. He's so far in Jeff Thorne's run that mm -hmm. I'm like, and that's my jam because I like Star Trek too. So yeah. Well, I like the again. He's opened up an end of Green Lantern that we don't often see with the, you know, with the bright circle and, you know, the the magic of the star heart. You know, Green Lantern is usually more of a scientific book. Now, we still get that, but we also get the magic kind of being infused here. And that's a main theme. And I like that. So, yeah, yeah. So it's it's, it's Although, kind of I have to say, where's Kyle? <laughs> 
I'm like, just Jeff, one panel. Let me know he's okay, please. Jeff, throw the. Can we throw this guy a bone just so that he every <laughs> shut, episode shuts up? <laughs> I know. No, Jeff, one panel, and whatever you do, don't kill him because you know the psychiatry bills that I'm gonna probably have to help pay for. If that happens, you know. Like, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So give give us a little Kyle update. Whatever you can. We're not gonna. Well, Jeff has said that like the next arc, and he's seemingly going to be on the book for a while. The next arc is going to be different than this, and okay. we'll see different characters. So, okay. yeah, yeah. So hopefully, one of them's Kyle. Okay, just don't spam his Twitter with hashtags. You know. <laughs> Restore the Rainer first. <laughs> <laughs> You know, these people are making me hate the word restore. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, sometimes when your internet go like your 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 browser like stops working. Yeah. And you gotta go back in and they say, Would you like to restore? <laughs> Whenever I see that, I'm like, no, just no, start fresh. None of this is restore garbage. I'm tired of it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, so I'm loving this book. Like I said, <laughs> uh, I wasn't a happy Green Lantern fan for a good uh, year, uh, but then Jeff Thorne came on the book, and uh, I've been loving it ever since. So keep up the great work, and uh, and I can't wait till the next issue. And keep up the great covers, DC. The variant covers, I'm liking them a lot. Yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah. But, By the uh, way, I also need to mention, Marco did on this, Marco Santucci and his wife worked on this book, too. Oh, yes. yes that, was, I, that is so cool. Yeah. You got, got, to love the, uh, got to love the husband and wife uh, tag team on, on she, the book. Uh, she's an amazing artist, too. Those two. Yeah, I've, yeah. Seen, some, I've seen some of her work. It's yeah. Just, yeah. Just spectacular. Um, so, uh, look, DC, put her on some more things, you know? Yeah. She's welcome in the Green Lantern fandom anytime. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, no, that's uh, that's pretty special. So, that, that's awesome. It was awesome when I read that. It was it was yeah. nice. Um, but uh, you know, you you don't have to wait till the next episode to hear us talk Green Lantern. You can talk Green Lantern with us. So, Donnie, if our if our good viewers and listeners want to talk to you about your uh, favorite DC franchise. Where can they do that? You can find me on Twitter as the Emerald Enthusiast. Let's talk comics. Let's talk collectibles. Let's talk Green Lantern. And you can find me at Adam underscore Lee's fan on Twitter. The podcast network has its own Twitter page. It's at MMNPDC. Or if you like Facebook and want to use Facebook, uh, you can. We have a Facebook group for the podcast network. It's somewhere listed in the description below. Uh, click that. I will add you, and we can continue the conversation there. But until next time, remember that John Stewart and the Green Lantern Corps are forever. From the first evolution to the last. So long, everybody. So long, everyone. <laughs>